Welcome back all you planeswalkers. It's time to dust off your copy of Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. We're going to deconstruct some of the elements of that book and see what that might mean for the new leaked book. I am the Deconstructive DM. Welcome to the show. And let's dive into some speculation of the mythical odysseys of Theros. Let's begin with an overview of the contents of Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. So, small disclaimer, I won't be going through the content of the book directly. I'll be deconstructing, summarizing, and critiquing. Please buy the book and support Wizards of the Coast if you're interested in this content. The book is 256 pages long, around about 230 is content. Ignoring the chapters and looking at the section content, we can equate larger sections with the Holy Trinity of the Dungeon Master's Guide, the Player's Handbook, or the Monster Manual. And we can then divide this content roughly up as follows. So the World Introduction, pages 4 to 9, uh, is starter info, it's roughly 5 pages, around about 1% of the book. Character creation and the guild dimension, pages 11 through 93, are equivalent to the player's handbook. That's around about 82 pages, and that's 36% of the content. The setting and creating adventures, pages 99 to 156. This is equivalent to Dungeon Master Guide content. That's 57 pages, or around about 25% of the book. Cranko's Way Adventure. Uh, this is page 160 to 171. Now, I've put this as Dungeon Master's Guide, although there isn't a direct adventure in the Dungeon Master's Guide, but it's the best equivalent. That's 11 pages long, and it's around about 5% of the content. Treasures and Unique World Items. This is page 173 to page 181. This is Dungeon Master Guide content again. It's around about 8 pages, or about 2% of the book. Uh, friends and Foes. This, this is Creature Stat Blog, so this is page 183 to 254, and this is equivalent to the Monster Manual. That's around about 71 pages long, or about 31% of the book. Now, obviously there are things like stat blocks scattered around the book as well, uh, but this is just a general classification. You can see where the meat of the book lies. I would expect a similar makeup for the Theodos book. Now, one thing that surprises me is whenever I skim through this book is the amount of thought for slotting this sec setting into D&D. So a huge amount of work has gone into building the setting, the lore, and generally tailoring the player's experience towards a 5e as a system. There's really no slacking from the Wizards guys uh, regarding the quality of merging Magic the Gathering into 5e. I'd also recommend this book alongside Dragon Heist for any DM who's looking to build a vibrant and sprawling city. This will give you a myriad of tools and options, as well as a blueprint for city adventures to get you started. Personally, I wish I'd read this book and had it before I'd built my own city district template, because it would have saved me a lot of time. And new content. Let's have a look at the direct new content in Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. So there are five new races. This is the Centaur, the Loxodon, the Minotaur, the Simic Hybrid, and the Vidalcan. The Centaur and Minotaur are not unique to Magic the Gathering, the other three are, uh, but this is the first time we were given official how to play these blocks. New classes, there are no new classes. There are two new subclasses. That's the Order Domain Cleric and the Circle of Spores Druid. Feats, uh, there are no new feats. And backgrounds, there are 10 new backgrounds. Technically, some of these are reskins of other backgrounds. I think most of them are, in fact. And one of them is directly the research uh, background from the player's handbook. Spells. There are two brand new spells. That's Chaos Bolt and Encode Thoughts. And monsters. I won't list them all here because there's too many. There's 78 new, new monsters. Now, there are no new types, but we get a special. I'll give a special mention to the type 1, 2, and 3 Crassus, which is pretty close. They're kind of a, like abominations, but they're like science experiments that have been speedily or evolved or genetically modified. So they have um, genetic adaptions to different environments. And then items wise, we've got 17 new magic items. Summarizing the Ravnica content. Obviously, as this is Ravnica and Ravnica's focus is on the guilds, the main content is around uh, how players fit the guild persona in and around their character and what that means in terms of personality, behavior, and play. As most would expect, this plays very similarly to joining factions in Dragon Heist, though it is more extensive owing to the Ravnica lore, offering you command of soldiers or servants, extra spells, special one-use trinkets, key runes that let you summon monsters, and special equipment. From a DM perspective, there's also a ton of role tables that fit the guild persona into quests, NPCs, and overall adventure goals. As everything uh, centers around the guild and the guild activities, we also have locations for each guild to focus on, which will mean lots of interaction and motion in a very vibrant and changing setting. Criticizing the Ravnica content. 
negatives. So my main issue with the Ravnica content is that the guild perks add so much and there's so many of them that this can be incredibly overwhelming. Just reading it through, uh, when I realize that there's 10 guilds, every time I hit guild content means that I know I'm going to be reading 10 doses of whatever section I've just hit and it can get very tiresome. If you aren't thoroughly into the theme that is. At the same time, there isn't that much of an extra dimension appeal as a lot of the guild perks are simply you get extra eggs. I also expect a serious drought of non-casters in these games, as if you're a caster you get access to a whole rack of free additional spells based on what guild you belong to. Um, I haven't really seen much balance to this other than the martial guilds like the Boros tend to get legions of troops uh, as their rank perk more often. Positives. So saying that, I spoke to a fair chunk of people on Twitter and almost all of them thoroughly enjoyed the new setting and tone. Uh, as a DM and a game designer, one of the things I find of huge value, especially to new players, is the purpose, immediate setting and help you get from your guild. So you're given a rank which increases through renown, you gain renown doing missions and furthering the interests of the guild. You're also given contacts inside and outside the guild. So these are building blocks of new characters that often new players stumble over when they first feel out a character and settle into a playstyle. It's a shortcut to being a few sessions in where the character has their own unique context built into play, um, their unique purpose, so short term, medium term and long term goal. It's also a shortcut to being a few sessions in where each character has their own unique contacts built into their play, as opposed to the hodgepodge of who has met who, which is usually that the entire group has met everybody. On to the Theros content. Firstly, let's go through the leak that occurred on Amazon for the book's listing. So, rise above the common throng with supernatural gifts. Abilities that give you remarkable powers set you on the path to legend. Explore Theros as a satyr or a Leonin, mythical cat-like heroes from Magic the Gathering. Mythical Odysseys of Theros introduces these races to the 5th edition D&D for the first time. Master new powers with Magic the Gathering inspired subclasses like the Bard's College of Eloquences and the Paladin's Oath of Heroism. Encounter mythic monsters, creatures whose power and renown are such that their names are truly living myths. Wield the weapons of the gods, five signature artifacts used by Theros' deities. So just to tackle the meat of that, we've got two new races, that's going to be the Leonin and the Satyr. We've got two new subclasses, which is the Bard's College of Eloquence and the Paladin's Oath of Heroism. And we've got five new items, which are confirmed to be the Spear of Heliod, the Bident of Thassa, the Whip of Erebos, and the Hammer of Perforos, and the Bow of Nylea. So that's what we have confirmed. Uh, two things mentioned that we can expand on. Uh, supernatural gifts and mythic monsters. Now, when dissecting the Ravnica content, I avoided tying specific mechanics to the content, as Ravnica's origins go way back into magic lore and spans far too many sets. However, that's not the case with Theros, which dates back to 2013, and I was still actively playing magic at that time then with some friends in the games industry. Supernatural gifts. I'm speculating supernatural gifts to have ties to several mechanics, namely Heroic, Devotion, and Bestow. Heroic in the set granted you an additional effect when targeting a creature with the Heroic property with a spell. Now this may translate directly, but would be highly situational and unusual that you are granted an additional bonus effect when somebody else targets you with a spell. When we consider the faction content from Ravnica and the confirmed presence of the five basic colour god items, I think we'll see something akin to uh, a cleric's channel divinity probably based on the god you decide to worship, and on your class. I'd be disappointed if they followed the same method as the guild rules and just granted you extra spells based on your affiliation. The second mechanic that we could possibly link to this is the devotion mechanic. The devotion mechanic was like a tally system granting you effects when your mana symbol count of a particular colour reached a certain number. I think this will translate similarly to the guild renown mechanic in Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica and granting you similar benefits. And the god cards themselves in the game worked on this mechanic, making them manifest as creatures only when your devotion had reached a particular level. It could be interesting to see if the gods make an appearance when you hit a certain level of devotion, uh, or if it does feature in that kind of way in the new book. Lastly, in regard to supernatural gifts, is, is the bestow mechanic. Now, the bestow mechanic 
allows you to cast creatures as enchantments on other creatures, granting them benefits, and if the enchanted creature leaves the battlefield, then the enchantment becomes a creature itself. The flavor of a lot of these cards is usually names like Thassa's Emissary, uh, implying that they've been sent by your god to grant you a boost and then help you out. Again, looking back at the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica book, this could come out as something similar to the key rune mechanic. Uh, the key rune items in Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica allowed you to summon certain monsters based on your guild alliance. And speaking of monsters, let's take a look at mythic monsters. Being based on ancient Greek mythology, it's no stretch to look at the potential monsters from the block and see what we have. Gorgons, merfolk, minotaurs, satyrs, spirits, zombies, archons, basilisks, chimeras, cyclopes, demons, dragons, giants, hags, harpies, hounds, hydras, krakens, lamias, manticores, Pegasi, Phoenixes, Sphinxes, and Sirens. It's a big bunch of stuff in that block. Uh, just to quickly expand on Archons. Uh, Archons are celestial beings, so similar to angels, but they usually have obscured faces. Lamias, which were female monsters with scaly bestial bodies, bodies but humanoid faces. So we have plenty of staples, uh, though we're here to talk mechanics specifically about the monstrosity mechanic. A monstrosity allows you to pay an additional mana cost on an already summoned creature to make it monstrous, usually beefing its stats up and granting it extra abilities. Now these range from simple things like flying all the way up to sheer insanity, like being able to block an additional 99 creatures or spawning X other hydras. What I'm hoping for is some new monster rules, uh, giving us two or even three stages to fights against monstrous creatures Sephiroth style. I'm also hoping that we get some chunky adventures centered around slaying one or two of these beasties in a similar manner to the Krenko adventure in Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. So that just about wraps up the leaked content, but we're not done yet, guys. So let's take a look at some more mechanics and dive into some potential locations. Other mechanics in the Theros block that may be relevant. Scry. Now, we've got plenty of scry spells already, but we might get some new ones. Constellation. Theros focused a lot on enchantments, and Constellation was lots of enchantments triggering each other and triggering together. It'd be fun to see some uh, multi-person spells or even rituals as a nod to this mechanic. Sagas. So in the new Theros Beyond Death block, we see the return of the Saga mechanic that first appeared in Dominaria, which is a way back when. And the idea being is that it's an enchantment with steps that take place over several turns. I don't really see this translating into anything other than adventures, uh, but maybe we could see something like uh, a modified suggestion spell which has specific steps attached to it. And lastly, escape. Cards with the escape mechanic can be cast from your graveyard for their escape cost. And talking about coming back from the dead and escape in the underworld, let's move on to our locations. In Theros, there are three main realms. You have the mortal realm, or world of the living, is our everyday normal world in Theros. Uh, there are three main cities in Theros, known as Polis. We have Miletus, based on Athens, uh, focused on magic and learning. Next we have Akros, based on Sparta, uh, based around, yeah, you guessed it, warriors and strength. Uh, and finally we have Setessa, which is inspired by Themyscira, I'm probably butchering that, based around nature and mysticism. Of course, a trip through the ancient Greek inspiration track wouldn't be complete without a tale about a city that was cast into the sea by an angry god, right? Eryx Methys, or Olantis, is an obscure legend on Theros echoing Atlantis. There are also minor polis for most races, including Asphodel for the Undead and Scuffos for the Minotaurs. Some other locations in the mortal realm include the Siren Sea, which is home to the Tritons, and the Dacra, or Enchanted Isles, which is full of nymphs and monsters that have been enhanced with the magic of the gods. The Chaparral, which houses the Skull Valley, is a verdant valley dotted with copses and is the home of the Satyr, which is one of the new races. Uh, the Nessian Wilds, which is the home of beasts, hydras, snakes, and centaurs and the Areskos, which is a rocky river valley in the remote regions of Theros, housing, housing Tethmos, which is the primary den of the Leonin, which is the other new race. Now, the mortal realm is surrounded by five rivers that ring the world, and below that is the underworld. Oh, what did you expect? It's under the world in its Greek mythology. 
Anyway, the underworld is the realm of the dead, and the dead in Theros dwell in the underworld regions based on the lives that they led. Known regions are Phileas, a wretched and tedious realm of the uninspired, Elysia, a protected realm, tranquil and vibrant, and Tiserius, outside the palace of Erebos. Now, I'm expecting that most likely that there'll be an adventure that runs along the lines of Journey to the Underworld and rescue the soul of your long-lost lover or something like that, a la Orpheus and the Underworld. And our last realm is the night sky where the gods dwell and the realm of dreams, Nyx. Now, this is a paranormal realm associated with dreams and the subconscious, uh, a literal proverbial night sky where the gods dwell. Nyx is so closely tied to the plane's deities that whenever they manifest, where they should be shadowed, they instead display glorious uh, starlight of the night sky in their silhouette. Dreams are seen as gifts from the gods, and so are enchantments, and due to their connection with this realm, whenever a mortal sleeps, they're said to be visiting Nyx. Uh, Tales of the Gods can be seen played out in the constellations. As we've got confirmation of the weapons of the gods, I'm sure we'll be looking at some interaction with Nyx. And that just about wraps up all the speculation I've got. I can't wait to see what arrives in the next book. Let me know down in the comments what your thoughts are on what I missed or what you hope to see, and let's wrap this up for now. Um, I originally intended this to be a short video, but it's already around about the 18 minute mark prior to editing. <sighs> Okay guys, that's it. That's the end of the video. I hope you like the show. Uh, as usual, please remember to like and subscribe. And if you find this content interesting, please share it around. Uh, if you want to come and chat deconstruction with me, you can find links to my Twitter and my Discord down in the show notes below. Uh, extra special thanks to everyone who replied to my questions on Twitter about the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica book. It looks like there's more than enough of an audience to keep these books coming. And that'll obviously give us more uh, chances to speculate on these things in future. So, in the meantime, 